Today we'll hear from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 to 11 as we this Advent season wait, watch, and hope for the coming of the Lord. There is comfort for God's people. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. By all outward appearances, they were the kind of people who really had it all together. They were powerful, they were successful, they were respected, they were wealthy. Their life was the stuff of dreams, or so they thought. Except, you know, they knew in their hearts that it hurt, or it was, was going to hurt. They'd spend their nights tossing and turning with sudden bouts of tears and melancholy. They would endure comments and questions that were unpleasant and uncomfortable. They would be put to the lowest portion of society. Hardly a day would pass when at least a small reminder of what they lost would come to their mind. And there was one thing that they wanted more than anything else. With every success, with every crowning achievement, with every wonderful blessing, there came a greater sense of emptiness and of longing. Well, they were poured out, and they were pouring out their hearts and souls to their sovereign Lord, their God of covenant, who had seemingly, or would seemingly, abandon them. We would wonder, as perhaps they wondered, why it would be for 70 years that God would not hear their prayers. Of course, these are the people of Israel living in the land of Babylon. Isaiah, in his message in the first 39 chapters, of his prophecy, reads or proclaims for the Lord words of judgment, his indictment against Judah and Jerusalem. And he foretells that they would come under the boot of Assyria and Babylon and finally the Medes and Persians. But it was Babylon who would come and take them away from the land of promise, leaving Jerusalem and Judea in ruins. A small remnant of people left behind, hopeless and in despair. It's a very hard thing, this idea of waiting and watching and hoping. And that's what Advent is all about, isn't it? Waiting and watching. And hoping. During the four Sundays in Advent, we join the people of the Old Testament looking forward and longing and praying with them, Come, Lord Jesus. And then Christmas arrives. But you know, our longing and our hoping and our watching and our waiting isn't just yearning for the coming of the Savior, for we know already that He has come. But it's also the watching and the waiting and the hoping for his return in which we say again, come, Lord Jesus. How familiar those words are to us, right, from the book of Revelation, because they form a part of our mealtime prayer. And how often do we pray them? Perhaps even three times a day. Once at each meal, come Lord Jesus. Well, Isaiah, the son of Amos, was a member of the royal family. It wasn't until King Uzziah came down with leprosy that Isaiah appears in the scriptures. Isaiah was a prophet and cared for God's people for almost 90 years. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, the evil king, and Hezekiah, who restored all of the worship of Israel that Ahaz had destroyed. He proclaimed the growth of the new empires that were coming, the loss of Israel, 
he, Isaiah, brought to both king and people the message of God's holiness and their own spiritual bankruptcy. And all this time, he pointed ahead to something wonderful coming. As we move from chapter 39 and all the indictments and the judgments, the condemnation of God against his people, suddenly there's a reversal here. Suddenly in our text today, God speaks as though all of the punishment, all of the chastisement that came upon Israel or would come upon Israel in 587 B.C. was over and done with. And now he speaks words of prophecy about the future. And God returns to his people upon whom he's, he's turned his back. And now through the prophet he says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and her sin has been paid for. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Yes, Israel would be given into the hands of her enemies. But, despite God's silence, now he turns to his people, and I don't know if you caught this, but he says, comfort, comfort my people. He says, speak tenderly to, here's a term of endearment, Jerusalem. Proclaim to her a message of joy, her hard service, her war, her military in hardship has now been ended. <clears throat> Her sin is paid for completely. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Not double payment for sin, but the words just preceding it, right? That her sin has been paid for and she now has received a double blessing of God's <coughs> abundant grace and favor. God speaks his words of hope and judgment to his faithful people, and in spite of their hardship, in spite of their suffering, God has not rejected his people. Yes, they are waiting. Yes, they are enduring. But they remain God's people, and he has not forgotten all of his promises of old. His promise to Adam and Eve, his promise to Noah, his promise to Abraham, and Abraham's descendants forever. Proclaim to her that her hard service is over. It has been completed. So the prophetic words of the gospel promise speak and they go through from God's timeless perspective to the accomplishment of her salvation in the coming of the Savior. It's a word of encouragement and not just encouragement in the sense of sympathy, is it? But it's encouragement in the sense of giving concrete my dear Jerusalem, your sin, sins which are many, are paid for. Well, how is that going to be? And then comes the voice of watching. Verse 3. There will appear a voice of one calling. In the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So from the in the desert of Paran, from the Mount of Sinai, God had, in the time of the Exodus, gone to Egypt to find his people, to take them out with a 
with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and to move them to his holy mountain to make them his people forever and to give to them his covenant of love. And now there will appear in the desert a prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And we know that voice for he has already come. John, the baptizer, proclaiming us a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And isn't that the message of all of God's messengers? Repent and believe the gospel. And so they came up to John in the wilderness. Those who were stricken in contrition and repenting their sins. And they lined up at the water. And there they were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. To prepare their hearts through word and, yes, sacrament, for the coming of Christ. And suddenly, as suddenly as the words comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord, suddenly the Lord appears on the scene, standing at the water before John. And the heavens are opened at his baptism. And the Spirit of God descends as a dove. And Christ in the Gospel of Mark suddenly appears the warrior of God to take on sin and death and the power of the devil. And he will do it. He will fulfill the promise that God has made to all of his people. The church of the Old and the New Testaments. God has accomplished this. We say it's marvelous in our eyes. The voice of one crying in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. By nature, it's really not love and grace that live in our hearts, is it? Not any longer. It's really warfare. And perhaps you remember in the older translation, God speaks to Jerusalem and says her warfare now is ended. That's our natural state with God, isn't it? Warfare. That we are in a struggle. We are trying to overthrow the gracious reign of God on earth. Or at least the old Adam within us is trying. He struggles and he fights. And he raises himself up. And it's through the gift of holy baptism that we in Christ are able to press him down. And as Luther says, each day drown that old man in the floodwaters of salvation, right? Which have come to you and I. That old nature struggles to be free, but in Christ, he has proclaimed now to us the victory. Their sin is paid for. The herald of salvation has come. Christ is marching to his cross, and he is upon it, and there for you and I, the uh, swords are now beat into plowshares. And because he has won the free and faithful forgiveness of God upon all that we have ever done, all that we have ever said or thought, we stand before our Savior, holy and pure and clean, you and I a holy nation to God. You and I are a royal priesthood to him who is the prophet of prophets, the high priest of priests, and the king of kings. God prepares our heart through the preaching of his word, through the teaching of his word, through the use of his sacraments, rightly administered, and we are his people by the power of that word acting in our lives as he draws us close to him around the altar, either here at church or the altar in our homes. The rough ground becomes level. The rugged places become a plain. And the glory of the Lord is revealed. We usually try to justify our actions I've been under a bit of stress lately, or I haven't felt well. I didn't have time. 
And yet, like Adam before us, we push the responsibility and the blame elsewhere on someone else. But God in his faithfulness and love, even though we strive against him at times, is faithful and he loves you. And he calls you his own. And he has made you, he has made you a kingdom, a kingdom for Christ. And so we have hope this Advent season. For Satan is defeated. The kingdom is ours in Christ. Although we have to face the suffering of this world, endure the hardship <coughs> as the voice cries, all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flower of the fields. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. We do bear the result of sin in our physical death. In the poor health that we endure. In the struggles that this world and Satan throw at us. It's true. But the grass here and the flowers that fall are not thrown into the fire. For the word of, the God, of God stands forever. It's a word of hope. It's a word of comfort. It's the assurance that we are loved. We come before him and we know that we are nothing. And yet he is everything. We're born to die and yet he was born that we might live. We know nothing and are sure of nothing, and yet his word of grace and pardon lasts forever and gives the pardon and the grace that it promises. In his mercy and his unfailing love, the prophet goes on and announces to Jerusalem that they should proclaim the glad tidings of God, the gospel of our salvation to all of the ruined cities of Judah that they might truly rejoice that their God reigns, that he comes to them in power and might, in gentleness and in mercy. For now the picture of the victorious warrior gives way in verse 11 to the familiar and comforting one of a good shepherd. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. The good shepherd gathers his lambs, his redeemed people for whom he has died, into his arms. And this isn't just any lamb. This word means those lambs newly born who can't quite stand up yet. He picks them up and he lays them in his garment that is around his shoulders. And he supports them with his arm. And there these weak and helpless animals find comfort and strength and nourishment. He says the good shepherd gently leads those that have young. The ewes of the flock who are nursing lambs can't be impelled to move swiftly to the next pasture. And so he takes his time and gently cares for each one as they have need. So they aren't stressed, so they aren't hurt. And for those who are tender at their breasts, there is life and health and peace. God does that for you and I, for we are his flock. We are those whom he loves, his precious treasure, those for whom he has died and for whom he lives again. So as we look with longing toward the coming of our Lord and reflect back on his first coming at Christmas, we wait. And we watch and we hope.
but not as those who have no hope, but as those who are the redeemed of the Lord, whom he loves and for whom he cares. Here are the words of Isaiah again that introduce these thoughts from God. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double the grace for all of her sins. Wait, watch, and hope. There is comfort for God's people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock and Bible class at 10.30.